Hey everybody, welcome back to The Garage. If this is your first time visiting my channel, please go ahead, click on subscribe, and also click on that bell to receive all the updates and activities on the channel. All right, uh, a couple updates real quick. We'll talk about the, uh, the ZRT in a minute. Uh, but if you notice, the uh, the Polaris ND is gone. Um, we got that ready for sale uh, throughout last week and posted it on Black Friday and... Um, and uh, it was it was sold within uh, a couple hours, so so that's good. It went off to a new owner, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll see it on the trail someday. But the Indy uh, Classic is gone. So as far as the uh, the ZRT, this is what we've done since the last update. Uh, last time we talked about it, uh, we talked about the uh, the carbs. Um, I had gone through the carbs. I I removed them and I cleaned them, and we had one issue. And let's see, if we get the. Uh, the CDI out of the way. Um, basically what was going on, if you see the vent tubes right down there, um, on the middle uh, carb, we had fuel coming out of the uh, the vent. And basically what's going on is uh, the O-rings on the plastic needle and seat are no good and it's allowing gas to bypass the, uh, the needle and seat and it's actually overflowing from the vent. So what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna remove the carbs uh, again uh, we're going to replace uh, those O-rings and we'll get those squared away. I'll show you uh, uh, the process on that uh, once I have those parts. But in the meantime, what I've done is I removed the uh, the pipes and knocked down all the rust off of them and I painted them. Cleaned up the, uh, the heat shields and everything else so, so those look good. Um, I know some people, there's uh, some debate on the... Uh, you know, whether these heat shields are good for the sled or they're bad for the sled. But you got to remember, in a, in a manufacturing state, um, the manufacturers aren't going to put anything into a product that's going to uh, uh, go against their bottom line. So if they can save a buck or 50 cents or 10 cents or five bucks per unit, trust me, they're going to do it to basically drive down manufacturing costs. And I can tell you, um, if... Uh, those things didn't need to be on there they wouldn't be on there they are more than a, a dress up item from the manufacturers and you know it's not just cat polaris uses them skidoo uses them yamaha uses them they're on there for a reason um and you know one of the reasons is you know they're insulated and they do uh reduce vibration on the pipes and the covers also you are meant to keep the pipes warm um but i know some people will say oh they trap moisture and everything else Another thing I'm going to say to that is if the sled is stored properly in a dry environment and it's not kept out in the rain and everything else under normal operating procedures and conditions, um, really those should never really trap moisture. Just like there shouldn't be any water in, in the bottom of the sled or the seat or anything like that. But if these machines are left outside, yeah, they're going to accumulate moisture and uh, they will rot. But, you know, when they're stored properly, it's not really an issue, right? So in the meantime, what I'll do is I'll tell you, this is my process as far as uh, painting pipes and, get, and prepping them. Um, I've done this like five or six times and I've had pretty good, good success on it. But essentially, this is what my process is. I'll take, I'll take the pipes off the sled, I'll strip them down. And what I'll do is uh, I'll wire brush them first all the way around, top to bottom, everything else, knock down all the heavy scale and all the other issues on it. And then once I do that, I'll then take a red scotch brake pad and I'll go over the entire pipe again with that. And that will kind of like even everything out and um, identify any areas that need to be gone, uh, gone again. Um, if I do need to do that, um, I'll hit it with a wire, wire wheel again and then scotch brite it. Once I'm happy with uh, how that looks, um, at that point, uh, I wanna take any oils and grease um, that may have been transferred onto the pipe and I'll just soak it down with brake cleaner, hose it down and, and get all that stuff off the, uh, the surface. And then I'll blow it off with uh, compressed air. And the next thing I do uh, before I apply any paint is I, uh, I um, I'll brush this stuff on. Essentially, I want to say it's phosphoric, phosphoric acid. Um, and what it does, it's, it's essentially, it's a rust converter. 
Uh, I brush this on, I let it sit 24 hours, and it neutralizes any active rust, and it, I think it converts any rust into iron sulfate. Pretty sure that's what it is, I'll have to look it up. And then 24 hours later, I let that cure, and then the next day, I'll apply uh, three coats of this paint, and it's Rust-Oleum, high heat, 2000 degree, uh, flat black paint. And again, I'll use three coats on that. And then once I've done three coats, the pipes then go on the sled for the heat curing process. And the heat curing process dictates um, once they're on there, you wanna do a, uh, a run at idle for about 10 minutes, and then you let it cool for 20 minutes. And then uh, you, you do that again, let it idle for 10 minutes, do another 20 minute cool down. And then last step is you run it for 20 minutes at another idle section. And this is what I do is, uh, cause you're gonna say, well, if the slide is just sitting there idling, it has a tendency to, it may have a tendency to overheat and cause issues. So what I, what I normally do is I'll take the sled outside, I'll take the garden hose, I'll stick it underneath the track and uh, have it between the track and the tunnel, and the, the tunnel. And I'm just spraying water on the coolers so it stays cool. So I can let this thing idle for 20 minutes and I have an issue. And then once you do that, essentially you're done. So uh, I've done this process for, I don't know, like seven or eight sleds. And I've never had an issue with paint chipping or flaking off or anything like that. And again, with any type of paint project, prep is a key. If you just if you just take the pipes off and don't do any prep work and paint, yeah, it's gonna peel. It's not gonna bond. It's not gonna adhere to it. So that's my process for uh, painting pipes. As far as the uh, the heat shields, um, you know there are a million ways to uh, kind of refurbish them, um, depending on your level of detail. You can spend 10 minutes on them, you can spend 10 days on them. But what I've done on this sled is I've taken some SOS pads and all I've done is I've taken SOS pads and uh, while I was waiting for the, the paint to cure with the rust reformer, all I did is I spent like two or three hours uh, with the SOS pads, cleaning them, cleaning them up and again, um, just getting all the dust, not the dust, but the dirt and the corrosion, everything else that accumulates on them over time and everything else. And again, I'm not going for a, a polish finish because that's not how it was ever came out from a manufacturer. It was more of a, a matte or a satin finish. And this frame watch kind of brings it back. You know, these, uh, heat shields are not perfect. They do have some heavy scratches on them. They do have some dings. There's one right there. There's one right there. Again, I'm not worried about it. Um, if you want, you can get really crazy on rehabbing these uh, these heat shields. Um, you can go at it with polishing compounds and you know do wet dry sandpaper all the way from six to four thousand, and then polishing compounds and whatever. So if that's your forte. Go for it, um, but I'll tell you, it's a lot of work, and this aluminum is not very um, rigid. It's pretty flimsy. And another thing is, you know, we got three pipes, and on this, on the first pipe, we got one, two, three, four sections of aluminum heat shields. So you times that by two because you got a, a top and a bottom. Now you have eight pieces, and then multiply it by two pipes. So now you have twenty-four pieces of. Uh, of heat shielding that you, you could theoretically go out there and polish. It would take you days to do that. And if that's what somebody wants to do, uh, I give you credit. Uh, it's more patience and more effort than I would want to do on it. Uh, but I think uh, using the SOS pad, uh, it works pretty good and uh, go from there. So the next thing we have to do on the Yardic Cat, like I said, is we got to pull the carbs off uh, redo the, the O-rings on the needles and seats. Next thing we gotta do is, and I actually found this when um, I was cleaning out the tank, the uh, the neck on the on the uh, cap, well the neck on the tank is is cracked. And I guess this is a, a, common, a common issue with these Arctic cats. 
Um, I don't know if it's because of the size of the neck or if it's just the size of the cap when people put it on, um, you know, there's a lot of surface area and it gets over torque and then the neck cracks. But I found a guy in a uh, in an Articat group that actually makes the, uh, a, uh, I believe it's a brass insert, it's a brass or aluminum. What it's, gonna, what it's designed to do is designed to go inside the neck and um, reinforce it. And not only does it reinforce it so you can't over torque the neck, it actually will seal this off from, uh, from any fuel coming out. So well, another thing I learned is why these seats have a tendency to crack right here is because of the neck. What will happen is people will uh, put gas in it and over time um, gas will leak out of the neck. It will come down here. It hits the covering on the seat and then it just dries it out and you get a cracking and this is what happens so that's why i guess if you ever see an iron cat in this spot this is why um so something to look out for something to be aware of so that part is on order uh that should be here by the end of the week we'll get that installed and at that at that point uh i'm gonna work on Getting that air box back in, because if you look, it's not like a normal air box as far as the boots. Um, Articat had a made an engineering decision to uh, uh, put the boots in a, like on a combo deal, where it's two in the one, and then you have a single by itself. But unlike a Skidoo or a Polaris, where you have the three individual boots, where it slides onto the horns of the carbs. This thing, you have all the surface area that goes up up, up against the, uh, the tunnel. And I guess it's a real nightmare to get in. And I can tell you, it was a real nightmare to get out. That's the easy part. Um, so, but I have a couple ideas of how we can get this thing back in. Uh, I'll get, I'll probably document that process, how it goes. And we'll go from there. So, all right. Uh, I think that's it. If there's any comments, questions regarding the, the cat or anything else, go ahead and leave them in the comments box. I'll get back to you as soon as, as possible. As always, thanks for watching and have a great day. See ya.